just uh, I think two more slides and then we're done. Um, one point that I, I thought you may find of interest is actually the uh, Association of the Bar of the City of New York um, just came out, uh, that, well not just anymore, a year ago came out um, with an opinion on the issue of outsourcing of electronic discovery functions. Um, uh, as Morty had, was mentioning, I, uh, uh, I do a fair amount of work in India and um, I've spoken on this issue a number of times. And I was in India two years ago speaking on the issue of outsourcing uh, electronic discovery support services, which would be folks that will, would, would take the lead in actually identifying and preserving, uh, maintaining chain of custody for your client's um, electronically stored information. When I spoke there last two years ago, there were about four vendors in the field uh, in India, um, in Bangalore, who were practicing on the, basically outsourcing the back office piece of electronically stored information. Today, there are over 40. I mean, that's, that, is, that amount of that is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of that work that is moving abroad. Um, it's a high volume, uh, low, uh, um, uh, low margin business. And so as a result of that, um, a lot of it, it, it's very ripe for outsourcing, and that's where it's, uh, it seems to be heading. Um, one final point that I would raise, uh, which is a, 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 a included only because I, I found an interesting case from this summer, uh, and it's my last slide, I promise, um, and, and that is um, uh, everyone seems to be focused, myself included, on the duties that attach as they relate to electronic discovery, and everyone just basically assumes that electronic evidence goes in and is received uh, in litigation, goes into trial without any uh, uh, hesitation or reservation by courts whatsoever. Um, I've worked on enough hearings and motions and trials to know that it's not often the case, in fact, I've never had it happen in 14 years of practicing, that a judge uh, or a fact finder has ever raised any issue when you've handed up a, an email uh, that you identify as having been written by one party and sent to the other. Um, but there's some very real issues given the size and scope of electronically of discovery directed towards electronically stored information now. There are issues as it relates to accuracy and authenticity uh, and the integrity of the data. And this is a case from the District of Maryland. It's actually a long case. It's 100 pages long in which the magistrate judge really uh, got himself involved in the issue of, you know, are we taking for granted the fact that all of this electronic evidence that we are now in the process of collecting is all automatically going to be accepted at trial uh, and basically looked at it from the perspective of uh, the federal rules of evidence. So again, uh, I think that's uh, something for you all to keep an eye on because I really think that's the probably one of the next things on the horizon. And um, with that, I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to talk about what I do. I'll tell you about my kids next if you want me to, um, uh, or else you can uh, I'll field any questions that anyone might have. Where do uh, text messages or instant messages come in? Into electronically stored information. They, are, um, they raise an entire real headache for um, most companies because of the fact that uh, somebody who's sitting at General Motors is probably using uh, a third-party service uh, IM. Uh, so uh, they, they're not running it through a GM server, uh, but yet at the same time they have a Yahoo account uh, and they're, they're pinging their friends on it you know, during the course of the day. So to the extent to which it can be accessed on um, uh, anything that's still residing on anyone's particular computer, absolutely uh, properly called for. Um, we've had issues trying to actually get um, uh, IMs from service providers. They don't really keep uh, that much of a history on your IM. So they, uh, I think that's an issue that's, that's presented. And then for text messages, same, same, same exact thing. Well, along those lines then, if it's um, something where they're doing personal communications while they're at work, sure. and nothing's stored on their computer, it's all transient and, and it's only on Yahoo's services or something. But to what extent are, are employees' personal email accounts and whatnot um, accessible through discovery? If, they, if they're if they talking about anything that's relevant to the litigation, they're absolutely fair game. And I think you'll find, um, to, to your point, um, there's a, there increasingly uh, you'll see folks that will just traffic on IM all day and they won't actually write email. And that IM account 
is not housed uh, anywhere within your client's uh, server system. It's actually it's a third-party service. Um, so that would be subpoenaed, and to the extent to which it's relevant, um, you can read it. Earlier yeah. we were discussing the types of electronic information that you had to give over things that were on hard drives and PDAs and servers and things that would not necessarily be handed over, things like metadata, and then you also mentioned that things that had to be rebuilt. In a situation that sounds kind of like that bankruptcy case you mentioned, the ghost server, what, what happens if someone's just using a regular secure deletion program, something like Erase or Incinerator, that's just randomly write the information, he's not expecting the legation, the legation hasn't started, anything like that, would that count as things that would have to be rebuilt and then therefore not be handed over? I, I'd say the answer to that would be no, that wouldn't count, um, and it would have to would not necessarily have to be rebuilt. I mean, so long as there's not a reasonable apprehension of litigation by that person when they're running that automatic program that's just that just happens to be residing on their machine, um, and there's no affirmative step that's taken by the individual who's maintaining the machine to actually affirmatively overwrite deleted files or purge anything from their, or attempt to purge things from their system then um, I don't believe that that would have to go back and be recreated. Um, you do, at the same time, however, find yourself in, um, it's an interesting area, frankly, because you'll, you can find yourself segueing into a scenario where, um, let's assume that uh, one, of those, uh, uh, one of those software applications actually purged uh, the only copy of data that might be relevant, that might speak to a particular issue of the litigation. There's no other source for it. You can't find it in any other system. There's no paper trail, there's nothing. Um, then you get into the issue that goes back to the Zubilaki case, which is to say, all right, well, I really need this now. So I'm now gonna try to find some way, if at all possible, to go back and recreate the data, um, to, to cobble it together. And you know, there's certainly, there's nothing that prevents you as the person who's seeking that information from going out and doing it on your own and, hiring a computer forensics guy and, and spending you know, 500,000 bucks. But what it really happens is, uh, in that situation, what the fight really becomes about is the cost of doing that. Meaning no one wants to spend that 500,000 bucks. They want to actually take it out of the person whose uh, machine caused it to be deleted. So that's where, the, and that gets fought about.